What's up, everybody? Welcome to Tesla Fix. Today, we have a very special, exciting guest here on the show. The factories of Tesla are very interesting right now. We've heard a lot about Mexico. We've heard a lot about the other factories, for example, the huge battery factory for the Giga uh, Megapacks, for example, and also China also expanding the Megapack factories. So very exciting stuff. And we want to look at, can Tesla reach their goal of producing 10 million cars in the end of 2030 or around 2030? And can the competition really keep up? Is there a competition actually? Um, that's why I've invited today somebody very special. Here is My Tesla Weekend. So Brian from My Tesla Weekend is joining us. And yeah, let's just jump right in. Welcome to Tesla Fix. Make sure to subscribe and like this episode. So, hi, Brian. Thank you very much for being here. I'm very excited for this interview. I've, I've looked uh, forward to this because uh, you were also a host of... Uh, uh, I've, 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 I'm, I'm a fan of your channel, of course, at first, but then I also saw you um, very often um, in uh, at, at Lars's channel, who is also a channel favorite right here. So you're part of the family <laughs> in that yeah. sense. So, yeah, Brian, uh, how about you just introduce yourself, what you do, and um, we're going to jump right in. Yeah, so I'm excited to be here too. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Lars does a great channel. So I run My Tesla Weekend. I started by doing side-by-side -side comparisons with factory progress by trying to mathematically predict when factories would finish and coming out far closer than I had any right to. And the channel has grown then into all kinds of analysis, uh, mm -hmm. not just reading the news, but getting a bit deeper and trying to trying to actually mm -hmm. see into the future. So that's what that's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, I really like your channel. You also, I, I really love how you, um, like your topics are very like broad also because you, you, I mean, you're in the Tesla community as well, but I really enjoy your your um, deep dives into the factories, for example, or if you talk about this, and um, that's why like I had to bring you on because um, I think um, the topics around Elon Musk and everything is, can sometimes be so distracting and also sometimes uh, people are are like skewed away from the main topics and um i mean sometimes it's a little bit funny actually i i was uh, talking to uh, farzad for example about this uh, that yeah should we just close down our channels now because um we we see that we are on track and everything seems to be fine it's just like over and over we always tell the same things but yeah it's very interesting many things are happening and it really seems like a uh, can tesla follow through with their plans to reach 30 um uh, uh, 20 million cars in 2030 and it really looks like it because they are expanding like crazy with the factories. And yeah, maybe you want to talk about the huge expansions that they're doing right now. Well, sure. So the first thing is, will will this topic get stale? No. Uh, <laughs> they said that to they said that to the drone pilots in Shanghai. What are you going to do when the factories done? Factories are never done, my friend. They <laughs> Not don't with finish. Tesla. Yeah. No, they no, well, that phase two. Well, now we're adding solar. Now we're putting in more bridges and roads. So the question is, can they get to 20 million in 2030? And the first answer to that is there is no other company that can because mm -hmm. no other company is even trying. If <laughs> Ford right. and GM mm -hmm. can grow by 20, 30 percent in that time, if Volkswagen can grow by even 30 or 40, they'd be amazed. They'd be they'd be over the moon, but they would also have no more capacity. That would be it. Tesla is planning for that. So let's look at what we've already got. Fremont, eh, it's only at 650,000. It's only the most productive car co uh, car factory in the US. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then you've got Shanghai, which for the longest time said, oh, 450,000, that's our capacity. And we're looking at the quarterly numbers saying, you're already over that. What are you talking about? So they've updated it to eh, a million. We know it's over a million. We've seen run rates over a million. And it's going mm -hmm. to expand a little bit before it expands a lot later on. And mm -hmm. then you've got the Berlin factory, which is uh, almost the same size as Shanghai, but of a newer design philosophy. And they're, well, we're at 5,000 a week. So that's, you know, a quarter million cars. Well, right, but they're running one line and they've got two more lines going in. Even with the footprint they have, that's a million car factory. Same mm -hmm. in Texas. It's a million car factory as it stands today, as soon as they can figure what they have before we even count Cybertruck. <clears throat> so that puts us at uh, Shanghai at a million, Germany at 
another two gets us three. Texas had another two gets us to five with Cybertruck gets us six. And then Mexico is going to get us another four. And I'm assuming we'll talk more about Mexico, but Mexico is, we know it's going to be bigger than any factory making cars in the world. And we know it's going to be faster, more efficient and making smaller, lighter, more cost effective cars to produce. So right there, you're already at 10 million. And we know they're going to be building a second factory at the same time as Mexico. That gets you to 14. We're within a stone's throw with just what's known. And Germany has just announced uh, permits in the last few yep. months to, to radically expand the footprint there. Yep. The roadmap to 20 is clear. So then the only question is, can they sell 20? Well, they're the mm -hmm. only EV company making a profit today. Ford and GM hope to get to a profit by 2025. And I hope they do too. But if you if you can't sell at a profit, <clears throat> there's no motivation. There's no incentive to sell in big. Sure. So 20 million, we can see how they can get there in terms of production. And we can see how they can get there in terms of deliveries. I mean, it's it's so astonishing. Heck, let the, let, let the number just be 10 million, which would be already um, absolutely like industry leading. I mean, for example, VW announced that or, or like it was a few months ago. I don't know if uh, if they changed their their goals right now, but um, it seems like that they just aim to produce around like 4 million EVs in 2030 or 2035. And that's pretty. Yeah, I, just, I mean, it's hard for them even to scale up. And if you see the, the powerhouse Tesla, expanding like crazy it's it's yeah i don't i don't really know how how how, how this will play out for them i i don't see a future in that hyundai regard, hyundai is a, is a big leader in evs their mm -hmm. goal is to get to 1.6 million by 2030 what are you talking about that's you're going to be oh. seven years behind tesla you can't what do you and most of the world is going to have a 2035 cutoff for internal combustion and you're only going to be at 1.6 million that's a concern and yeah 20 million is it's impossible because it has never been done i think the best mm -hmm. company's year ever was 11 million and you're going to almost double that yeah that's the plan mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah the question is Does Tesla have a demand problem? Because that's the last thing. We, because we know they can produce, like, like, like you've illustrated right now. If they expand and do their, do their, um, um, improve their efficiencies for, especially the the smaller car. That is, by the way, very important for the European market, especially because, I mean, yeah, uh, I had a discussion on Twitter uh, about this because. Um, Uh, it was like I, I said that Germany is a low wage country and people lost their mind because they said, no, Germany is like it's, it's leading almost in the in the statistics and blah, blah, blah. But it's not this way. I mean, the taxes are very high here. Um, our median is around um, like 35,000 US dollars, for example, in a year. And but we have like, yeah, our living costs are very high for example we we pay around 500 or, or 600 to 1000 uh, 1200 for living here it depends on where you live but the the rents went up like crazy in the last 10 years and um yeah also we have a lot of health care we have mandatory health care here so you have to pay it it's around 600 700 dollars a month that you that's also deducted from your wages so uh People don't have money for actually for a like 45,000 uh, euro car in the average in Germany. So the mass of the uh, Germany really needs a sub 25,000 dollar car because in, in Euro Europe, especially people buy just used cars. It's, it's very common to buy used cars and used small cars. So around 10,000 euros, for example. So that's pri the price range we are really talking about uh, when we talk about the masses in Europe, for example. But yeah, that, that's why it's so important to, to um, reduce the price. But I think they will have demand if they lower the prices. That's, that's the thing. And I don't know how you stand uh, on this topic. but oh. Absolutely. Elon was right when he said, mm -hmm. there isn't a lack of demand. There's a lack of buyers at the price point that the cars are currently being sold at. And yeah. every time there's a, there are charts that uh, I can send you after we're done that show <laughs> okay. that show as you move down in price, the demand increases significantly. The a total course. addressable market just grows like crazy. 
-hmm. And even if you can cut 3,000, 5,000 off the price, and if you look at it, you know every car they sell is at a positive margin, but you also know that the Model Y costs more than the Model 3, even though the Model Y is cheaper to build. So there's margin there to play with. Uh, and when they eventually do refresh the Model 3, add the structural battery pack, the front and rear castings, that'll bring the price down and add other efficiencies that I'm sure they've wanted to add along the way. The cost of those will become more affordable before we even get to thinking about the compact car. So yeah, I agree that lowering prices isn't, it is about spurring demand and it's the most effective way to spur demand. Uh, but no matter how much demand you have, if people can't afford it. And yeah, you were saying 40,000. There's a lot of these Teslas that are selling for 50, 60,000. And that's a lot of money, especially mm -hmm. with the fact that interest rates have gone up so much. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I also think that, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, people, I mean, we, we Germans buy their BMWs, they buy, they buy their Mercedes's and they don't, they're not cheap, especially they lease um, most of the time their, their cars or um, like um, uh, do it over the their business, for example, they, they, they have a business car that they can deduct from tax and everything. Um, that's that's the main move that many people do here um, that are a little bit above the average uh, salary here. But um, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's 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 totally true that that this will have a huge impact on on the long term goals also of Tesla because Tesla's goal isn't to earn as much money as they can. They want to bring as many cars on the road uh, in mass production so they can like the people have access to the cars and then they have their robot taxi fleet for example they also have these um for example these leasing options that i mean they take the car back and they want to keep the car i think um this will also be a thing uh, in the future that um tesla will buy back the cars to their taxi fleet for example and stuff like that that's, that's something maybe a development we might see It's also very exciting. Um, yeah, but um, do you think that the um, the uh, oh yeah, now now I've lost my point. <laughs> um, PR and marketing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, do you think we? Thank you that you brought it up. Um, do you think that we need PR and marketing to increase like the? the uh, excitement on the product or anything do you think it's necessary to have to have a huge marketing team or pr team so i think Cortesa? pr is important they obviously have somebody working in that capacity now and they've they have it in germany they have it in shanghai yeah what they don't have is a is a is a department a traditional mm -hmm. department in the us but they're still putting out films little of videos on the channel that are absolutely public that are, that is PR and marketing right there. <laughs> yeah, of course. I was wondering so much because every <laughs> whenever I read, whenever I read, oh, they need a marketing team and I, I'm like, guys, uh, these videos are not falling from the sky. Somebody has produced <laughs> them and they are paid, so they have a budget for this, so they yeah, I mean, it, it's obvious yeah. they they produce they're content. Very, so they're very high yeah. quality, they're very slick and they do convey a message. What they don't do is necessarily get in front of the right people. They're getting in front of you and me. You and me, we don't need any more convincing. We're on board. But yeah. uh, when the Cybertruck fake out crash video ran, that got 17 million views within the first half a day. And it's now sitting around 70 million views on Twitter. And that's just on the primary source, not counting all the other places that replayed it and analyzed it and talked about it. And that was brilliant because the the question has been asked how is this thing going to do in a crash test and while they still haven't shown it everyone got to talking about it and the experts weighed in like sandy monroe who said this is absolutely going to crush just fine just like any other truck probably even a little bit better and i would like to see them expand the pr department so that people like me uh might never get to see the inside of a factory i've only mm. been i've only been to six different factories and events without getting in. So maybe the seventh one will be the charm. <laughs> But the, the problem is I, I'm a small channel still by, yeah. by, mm. by a lot of standards and they don't know I exist or maybe they don't like me. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's the, the huge black box that everybody has. Uh, 
to yeah. deal with uh, uh, like uh, uh, Omar from Homer's catalog was not invited for example and but but he has a huge following of course um and yeah he was specifically disinvited oh oh, oh yeah uh, even that oh, God, yeah he was actually that's, uh, he's on the blacklist yeah. on <laughs> yeah but i think that Elon is... stark uh, blacklist book <laughs> i i think i think they're on better terms now but apparently omar yeah. had leaked something that that they didn't want uh, out okay and so that's why i'm very careful with my leaks i have a, a number of sources in a number of places and i am very careful with what i share yeah but but that's also good because i think um sometimes it's strategic not to share information of course and uh, especially internals but but we all know the tesla community is very hungry for new information we uh, sip everything up we get in front of our eyes uh, even if if sometimes it's just somebody said this and that uh, even if, if it's not much confirmed but we we tr try our best to to uh, look through the details there but uh yeah I, I, but i think um the tesla community is one of the biggest also one of the biggest drivers also for for the company because um it's it's i mean for vw for example or or mercedes there are isn't th this kind of fan base or something that that is following the company because they're just doing their internal combustion engine cars more or less i mean they have their electrified uh no they they're going into the electric um, vehicle market more and try to expand there but um yeah people don't get as excited about this because they weren't the first mover of course and uh, i mean tesla is such a unicorn it's like amazon or apple uh, and so uh, it, it has a f pretty big fan following and uh, i think this also has a huge impact the tesla community really helped tesla leverage um in in, in times where it was tough also for the company yeah well, and I think it's I think it's not only bigger than Apple in terms of fan engagement and excitement. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's ten times bigger, mm -hmm. maybe a hundred. <laughs> there, how many Apple channels are there? Some, I assume. I know there are people mm -hmm. who have tried to start channels about their Ford Mach E. <clears throat> they don't get traction. There are drone pilots who have flown over other factories, but unless it's something tangential to mm -hmm. Tesla. Like Wuwa in Shanghai will also fly over the adjacent CATL factory mm -hmm. a mile away yeah. because that's, I mean, there's the overlap is huge, but you can find drone footage of other factories being built, but only one or two, and then no mm -hmm. one watches. That's true. Yeah. And, and not as regularly. I mean, we have updates, like weekly updates about the factories. Uh, for us to, to be a slint in Germany, uh, uh, my man Twice here in Germany. Twice yeah, a week. Once a week. Twice a week crazy yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, so awesome out there all the time yeah that's true yeah it's it's interesting how people um get excited about the company but i think it's because they're um i mean without elon musk it would be a little bit tough for the company i think because he has such a celebrity status or such a i mean he's so controversial he's everywhere and um yeah he has a big following also so he's i mean that's why the PR department, for example, or, or, or the marketing team, it doesn't have to be as big because he's an influencer, so he can market Tesla. But um, the problem also is a little bit if he's too controversial, it also has an effect on Tesla a little bit. But I think um, just for the masses, I think the hardcore fans really stick to the company because they know what the company is doing and it, it's not tied as much to Elon Musk anymore than it was before. Before we always thought, oh, okay, Elon Musk is running the ship. He's still running the ship, but now he has like the team grew and also Tom, uh, his name was um, Tom Zhu. No, Tom Zhu. Mm -hmm. Tom Zhu. Yeah, from, yeah, yeah. Um, from China, and um, yeah, he. I mean, he was announced as the uh, I don't know the position in senior English? vice president of automotive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 and. Um, yeah, you you see that that the company isn't as dependent anymore, and I think it's a, uh, in, important a signal also because to grow to twenty million, we really need like a, a bigger team. It, it has to grow, and um, of course, and yeah. and that's what we saw at Investor Day was we saw who the team is, and we got to mm -hmm. hear from each of them. And here, these are genuinely competent people; they know what they're talking about. There were days when, if Steve Jobs had died at a different time. Mm -hmm. Apple would have been in trouble. 
Of course, yeah, Steve, totally. Steve Jobs Steve Jobs had it set up so that when he was gone, yeah. now the company's much less exciting, but mm -hmm. much bigger and more profitable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the same is true with Elon. If if for some reason he were to depart Tesla, uh, I don't think the company is in any danger. Maybe it wouldn't mm -hmm. be as exciting or visionary anymore, yeah. but it would continue to grow. All the pieces are in place. In the early days, he wasn't driving the ship. He was down there with you pulling on the oars. And now... <laughs> He can he can just stay back at you know at the at the base and and tell you where to go on the map, and that's mm -hmm. a much healthier place to be, um, mm -hmm. for everyone I think. Yeah, and also think he I mean he's like a huge workhorse. We all know that he runs so many companies, but um, I think he also has to step back to to um, get like a little bit. I mean I mean make some room for his thoughts also to to improve and stuff like that. But um, I think now it's at a place where where he has to adjust maybe the team a little bit sometimes. And um, if, if there's trouble, he has to step in maybe a little bit more. And um, he's running Twitter on the side or his dog is running Twitter on the side <laughs> to be more specific. <laughs> Who knows? But uh, yeah. So yeah, but but I think um, we're in a good place to to go to the next step and you really see with with the uh, with the production rate um ramping up that it's working obviously uh, so we're really glad about that but um have what what's your view on the on the mega packs um and the mega pack factories because um they are also expanding and that's a, a whole new thing because um in germany we had a huge crisis with energy we know that uh, right we are pretty near to russia we are very dependent or were very dependent on russia and still really am we have a huge gap now we we burn coal like uh like we we've it started to grow a little bit but germany is on a great path for renewables of course uh, it really declined over the years and uh despite elon musk's uh, advice not to shut down our nuclear power plants we did because it was decided like 15 years ago already and we've started to to um take them off the grid but we made our, ourselves dependent on russia which is really stupid right now like we see um and the politicians really screwed up but um now we see that the energy business i mean it's a bigger business than automotive and um, absolutely and and m my guess is also if like tesla is the only company that is in the position of shifting their business if it's necessary for example they can Produ uh, take the cells of the car manufacturing and put it into the battery pack and sell more uh, mega packs, for example, or more home energy, um, like their power, uh, Tesla power wall and stuff like that. So I think they're in very good position with, I mean, if they have too much batteries, they're going to shift and put them <laughs> into something else. Um, but maybe you can tell yeah. us something about the uh, mega packs. So what they've done, uh, and this I can probably share, is they've okay. kept the original mega pack line running. I think it mm -hmm. might still be running today. If not, it's closing down like this week in Nevada. That was mm -hmm. you making batteries uh, um, of the 52,000 pound variety, the version one, the version twos coming okay. out of Lathrop are about 40% bigger. They're 82,000 pounds. So when they put them on a, <laughs> a semi truck that has to be the kind with extra, extra wheels to handle yeah. the weight. And they're already making 10 a day. These are $2 million Oof. each. So that's $7 billion in revenue already just from that. And the margins look to be pretty ridiculous because they are using LFP batteries from China, which are cheaper than regular high nickel batteries and they're also good because there's a limit to how much nickel and cobalt is readily available before it starts impacting the price these batteries don't use any of that they use no conflict materials they use minerals that are available in every country practically and they could they're already announced they're building another one of these factories in shanghai so they're going to be getting mm -hmm. to 20,000 mega packs a year realistically by the end of next year and then if the factory is looking like it's already dialed in, why wouldn't they add another one in Germany? Or maybe mm -hmm. that's what they're going to be putting in at Berlin. We don't know yet exactly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. because of the nature of it, they could put these on every continent. Mm -hmm. Anywhere there's power, there's a demand for it. And presently, 
The markup is astronomical. It's easily over 30%. It's probably closer to 40% mar uh, margin. So this could be, it's one of the questions that investors are asking on the say technologies portal is how soon, you said it could be as big as automotive, when? And the answer is two, three years. It's going to be real big, real quick, because this doesn't require the same kind of PR. You have a product, people need the product, either it works or it doesn't, either it's the right price or it isn't, and that's it, it's done. So it, it makes it a much easier sell. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, absolutely astonishing. And uh, I mean, Tesla has so many it's, uh, potential successful business models on the side or, or, or categories, let's say categories. I mean, we have the, the automotive sector, the energy sector can be from the revenue um, perspective much bigger because the um, demand for batteries and battery storage and storage uh, especially is very high in every country. We can get rid of the uh, dirty pika plants that rely on coal and gas for, for if, if, the, if the, we have a spike in the, in the, if, if before the network breaks down, we need those pika plants to adjust to the demand in that uh, time and then we can t take our our uh, mega packs for example also the the home charging um is also very important with their smart grids for example with their um auto builder software for example and uh, distributing in a in a network of houses which makes absolutely sense and so so they have the know-how of future technologies it's not just cars i mean it's like they and now we have the the tesla bot uh, on the horizon uh, that is already already produced already uh, uh, making his first steps and uh, even uh, there are indications that they are already at the line sometimes and do so, uh, they they test some stuff there already uh, but we don't really know um let's see but uh, like this was indicated in the in the uh, video clips they they shared um like uh, you could see okay that's a pr real production line and uh, they're testing the robot there for smaller work and um also scott from twitter you might know him too um scott um, all, um is, is also is a, uh, an expert on the robotic front and he also talked about that yeah the the robots could be like could be used today actually and they might might already have been used for there were maybe some model threes or model y's that ran from the factory that were already <laughs> with the robot so the robot industry is also a thing <laughs> robotics is very um um a future topic and we might see i mean it doesn't make backflips but it can walk by itself maybe and that's a pretty I don't, huge advantage i don't because... need it to do backflips i need it no. to understand yeah. the world and be able to navigate <laughs> yeah. without qr codes which is how boston exactly. dynamics gets around and boston dynamics makes these beautiful demos that yeah. are all very carefully cut together and of when you course, see them yeah. out there dancing and you look mm -hmm. to see who's watching the employees aren't impressed because they've been running this for three days to yeah, get it right once. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. yeah. And so Hyundai's got Boston Dynamics. Volkswagen is getting into robotics. I, I don't know why automotive companies are interested, but they are. And so I guess that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, Tesla has a lot of paths to success between self-driving, between the power mm -hmm. walls, the power, the auto bidder, the mega packs, owning their own mega packs which is something mm -hmm. they've already done a little bit in Texas and they're expanding it at Giga Texas. There's, there's uh, how many companies could they spin off that you would still invest in? And for me, the answer is uh, 12, 15. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they design their own chips. I would invest in that company. Yeah. And it's so interesting. Many people uh, also, I mean, uh, full disclosure here, uh, like, uh, I, I'm also invested in Tesla because I'm I believe in the company, of course, and um, so. But everybody can do whatever they want. I, I don't give financial advice, but for me personally, it's interesting to to hear um, when I talk to people that they say, "What what you just invested in one company?" Because I'm just invested in one company, and uh, I'm like I'm like, yeah, I'm invested in a technology ETF, if you put it that way, and they have like 
even the AI development that they have internally for their uh, like like uh, Joe Justice also always talks about this uh, their their automatic management s system that that gets rid of managers you don't really need managers there and uh, from the even the supply chain so the line changes if a part isn't available in the future so uh, stuff like that is very crazy like like it's so connected and um even this thing alone is so such an interesting startup to invest in for example but it's full like you said like 15 or let it be 20 startups i don't know um yeah it's like an etf actually i think it's it's interesting that's, that they have a good way every core future it, really. technology yeah mm -hmm. yeah so who, so should we talk yeah. about who else is going to make it and who else isn't yeah of course yeah we really I, I i want to see if you compare it now to traditional uh, auto companies that are have a tradition that have the lo legacy problematic that like Eight years ago, had a huge scandal in the U.S. with their Dieselgate uh, uh, thing, VW, of course. Uh, they just came out of this. They got rid of Herbert Dies, which was the biggest mistake they could do. And now they, uh, yeah, they have uh, the guy who likes e-fuels as their new CEO, uh, Oliver Blume, who's running Porsche. And uh, also in Germany, we heard a lot of discussions about e-fuels and they want to make exceptions because uh, EU um, decided to get rid of internal combustion engine cars by uh, 2035. But this is already, they try to sc screw around this, uh, this uh, uh, law now and Germany tries to defend their market, of course. And now they, they like, they're kicking and biting to not... To not to, to don't have this law in place, but it's decided. But now they try to uh, build in some workarounds and stuff like that, and e fuels and stuff like this. So I'm not really sure. What do you think about the competition overall? We don't have to be talking specifically about German car brands, but uh, also the U.S. car brands. But what do, how do you sure. see it? Is there competition? Well, I'll tell you where it stands today. Mercedes is is not making what I would consider very compelling EVs. I don't think they have the Mercedes styling I expect. And for the price, I'd rather spend half as much and get an internal <laughs> combustion Mercedes, which yeah. would be nicer and prettier and more fun. That's true. I mean, That's it, true actually. And compared to other EVs, they're not particularly powerful. Um, not efficient, maybe longer uh, range, yeah. but not efficient. Yeah. 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 Volkswagen, on the other hand, I think is really getting aggressive. I think mm -hmm. they are going to be a clear survivor. Uh, yeah, because they've got a variety of models in a variety of shapes and prices. And I think they all look at least pretty good. They don't have any real dogs in the lineup um, and they are moving in the right direction. They're moving very quickly and they understand that they have to. I think Herbert Deese got them moving in the right direction in a way that was strong enough that it was easy for Bloom to keep, just keep going. When yeah. it comes to the, the U S guys, uh, We've got our Chrysler Dodge group, which is owned by Stellantis. Mm -hmm. They do not seem to have a very solid strategy yet. They've got a lot of hybrids that are very competent and capable. Take it another step, guys. Make it electric. But I think they're going to be very slow to the game because our tax structure is set up to reward e uh, plug-in hybrids almost as strongly as EVs, which is crazy. But all mm -hmm. right, whatever. <laughs> and then when it comes to China, there's one big player there that I think stands a chance of being as big as Tesla. Any guesses which one it might be? B it B rhymes B with B. <laughs> B <-Y> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's BYD. Can you guess what is it? Yeah. <laughs> right? Because all the other ones are still kind of in startup mode. But mm -hmm. BYD not only already has cars, already makes a ton of, e of plug-in hybrids, but they also make a ton of EVs. And they have the same kind of advantages that Tesla has. They battery make their own batteries. Yeah. They design their own chips. And yes. while they're not going all in on autonomy, they're partnering with NVIDIA, which I think in the short term yeah, is a, a good safer move. strategy because yeah. they're not going to waste $10 billion for something that for them might not, might not work. And it's a, and it's a good partnership. So they yeah. could 
very easily be in the mega pack business as well. They could very easily be in all these businesses that mm -hmm. Tesla is in with competency and capability. Now the BYDs are, um, they're still not as good as they should be, but they're reasonably good, reasonably priced. And it appears to be that they're actually making money on them, which is, which would make them one of the very few companies in the world yeah. actually turning a profit. Yeah, yeah, but but I think the margins are still a little bit low in oh. comparison, of course. But but still, I mean, they're on a good track, and also see really also in the German market, um, especially or in the European market, that the um, Chinese companies really um, had a good idea. They bought brands in Europe, and they produce in China. And but but for example, MG is a good example. They the MG yes. is an English brand that was bought up by a Chinese by, by I think it was Geely, Geely? Maybe? Geely? I, I think, think it was. so. Yeah, yeah, I think it was Geely. And also Volvo for uh, uh, not Volvo Polestar for example is also a prime example in my opinion because this company uh, could they they make a better Mercedes than Mercedes actually. Yeah, and that's what I <laughs> that's what what I think because uh, they are very de design focused. They're more uh, very like Swedish design philosophies. I think it was Swedish. I hope I'm not uh, butchering this. I think so. This, I think so. I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sorry for <laughs> the country where the brand is from because it's uh, it de derived from Volvo, of course. But I think this is a good strategy because I think the European market um, is a little bit hesitant with Ch Chinese cars like with the br Chinese brands I would I have to say Chinese brands but I think that's a good strategy to take another brand that is also uh, already familiar in the in the in the countries and then uh, use that and I think Posa is also doing a great job um the software also seems don't seem to be as buggy as VW for example that's a point where I might disagree with you a lot um with VW because um yeah they the it, the software issues they still have are so huge that I think okay many customers who just want to drive their car without smart intelligent features like in a Tesla for example they can do that and I think they make a variety of cars which is also very important but um, Tesla also announced it now maybe a, a, a tr a, we we might get a not. It, like a truck or, or not a sprinter or something like that like oh um, a van a van a van, a van sorry yeah. yeah a van a van for example and and this is very like gets me very exciting because i know like just like apple they have a very small product line actually they have a few products but they are like really optimized to the max and i think that's the right approach and vw is um i mean before they can develop one product, they they just okay. We have this platform. We make this car, this car, this car, and that car, that model, and this model. I think they are going too fast there, but they have to because people are used to that from VW. And um, so yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not really sure with VW if I mean I mean they really try and they really do um, produce more. And I've seen a lot of ID buses here in uh, in Germany and Switzerland, for example. So. They are uh, selling those, but um, yeah, we will see how, how they can expand their mass production because that's very important for for VW because many jobs are reliant on VW here in Germany, of course. And uh, yeah, but yeah, that's that's it's my crazy opinion. because yeah. uh, you're you're absolutely right about the foreign brand but Chinese made. That's mm -hmm. that's the iPhone. No one thinks of it as a Chinese product, even yeah, though it's true. It's <clears throat> And it's because it's not a, it doesn't feel like a Chinese product and Chinese brands are finally coming around uh, for the mm -hmm. longest time. Nobody would buy anything Chinese. And, you know, and I've got my DJI pocket mini. My <laughs> yeah. Mini, and DJI is like a real serious homegrown Chinese brand. Yeah. That is, that is in a league of its own yeah. uh, in terms of what they're doing. And so yeah. it's taken them a long time to get where they're at. But these Chinese brands are are coming. And yeah. the U.S. has these very protectionist import taxes where cars from yeah. China would have a 27% import tax, mm -hmm. which is okay. right there. You're not going to sell a BYD for 50000 um, mm -hmm. But BYD is thinking about opening a factory. And if they do, there you go. They can bring all their design philosophy mm -hmm. and roll it out here.
So mm-hmm. it's a, it'll be something to watch. Yeah. Like VinFest also. I think VinFest also tried to open up a factory here, the Vietnamese um, 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 car company, which is also very interesting that they, like suddenly there are some brands we never heard about and they are um, popping out of the fl- uh, ground. And the American legacy car guys are like, uh, uh, what product do we have? Or, right. or like you said, right. <laughs> or Dodge, like you said, for example, Dodge or, or, or the Stellantis from the Stellantis group, the brands, they really lack in, in, in the EV space and uh, bet on the hybrid horse that is, uh, has both disadvantages. And <laughs> I don't know. Right. It's <laughs> I, uh, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's crazy. But, um, I think we 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 reached the end of the episode now because we are a little time constrained today. But um, I, Brian, it was a pleasure pleasure to talk to uh, to you about Tesla. And um, for me, the last question at the end, um, I would like to hear from you. Um, what do you think will be the most important topics going forward um, with Tesla right now? And um, yeah, maybe you can. Take us a little bit on a journey into the future. Uh, what do you think uh, is, is the key things they have to focus on right now? Okay. Mm-hmm. So the <clears throat> ramp of the Cybertruck is imminent and it's going to take a bit of focus, but it's the simplest thing they've ever done. And I know it sounds like it's something very radical and different, but from the conversations I've had with Sandy Monroe, he said, this isn't a physics challenge. It isn't even an engineering challenge. They just have to build it. And that's where we're at. The big focus coming forth is going to be watching Mexico get built and watching what the design philosophy of unboxed uh, design looks like in practice. Is it even a straight factory anymore? Is it an octopus that comes together <laughs> with all the people? Yeah. Is it a vertical octopus? We don't know. We're going to find out soon. And all the other car makers are still trying to catch up with what Tesla did with the Model 3. Some of them have gotten there. Now they're trying to catch up with the Model Y. Tesla has moved past that. The Cybertruck is unboxed light. And unboxed is going to change everything. And if you're trying to make a $25,000 car and you're not doing something like that, you're not going to make it. You're not going to. Maybe you'll have it at a 2% margin while Tesla's at 20, 25, 30%. So the thing to watch that all of us are excited for is Giga Mexico, Giga Nueva Mm -hmm. Leon. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's where my focus will be. Okay. Interesting. So with, for, for the audience, um, um, those who might not know, what do you mean by unboxed, like or, or boxed? Oh, like yes, yes. So normally, ma- you ever, do, do you mean this? Seen, this that's the one. That's the one. That's the one. Okay, perfect. Everybody, everybody else puts it on an assembly line. We've all seen what it looks like. Even Tesla does it with the Model Three. But this is, you know, what instead of just mounting the seats to the battery, like we started showing off at the Berlin opening, let's mount everything to the everything and just bring it all together at the mm-hmm. last minute. So that there's never a wait. If there's any slowdown anywhere in the line, it doesn't matter because we've got six or 10 front assemblies ready to go. We've got only four rear assemblies. That's not a delay. The pieces are still in ready supply and it allows it to just go together, uh, apparently, much more quickly and cheaply and with less delay. And you don't have to have robots or people climbing in and out of the holes to do all the work. It just happens first. Yeah, they just stand around the box and uh, just build the parts. It's like a professional Lego builders who build their parts and just put them together in the end. It's almost like that. It's it's yeah, it's astonishing. This production uh, method alone is is like uh, will will shoot them light years ahead again. And you they how, already how, produce a yeah. Mo- yeah. They, That's yeah, how they build they all- ships already is in yeah. pieces. Yeah. In st- yeah, because it just makes more sense. It makes sense. Absolutely. If you see it, then you think like, oh, how, how, why did we have to, uh, done that before? <laughs> a, yeah. a thousand years of shipbuilding and we just came <laughs> yeah. up with this. Yeah, that's <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's very interesting. So, yeah, I, I'd, be, I'd be glad to to hear from, from you uh, when you analyze the new production methods. I think you're most excited about Giga Mexico, maybe um, from I the am. test community. And we also hope that everybody from my channel who are not subscribed to my tesla weekend please do i mean i have a very small channel it's like 1500 or 300 people 
watching, but hey, everybody, everybody starts and I really love, enjoy the yeah. conversations I have with the people from the Tesla community and Brian is one of my favorite channels and um, he, he does great work. So everybody, please subscribe. I'm going to link it uh, over there on the corner. And yeah. I appreciate that. And next week I'm going to be at Fully Charged in, uh, in, in Farnborough, England, speaking on the morning of the 27th, 28th. Yeah, awesome. in the morning of the 28th. So if anyone's there, I'll be there all three days. You can try and find me. I don't know. It'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, so, so sad that that uh, I can't make it to England in that time. I would love because it's so so near. And um, yeah, I, I've I've ordered uh, the Giga beer and still don't have somebody to drink it with me. So <laughs> I I have it right here. The Tesla Giga beer, <laughs> but uh, yeah, maybe maybe Brian, one day when you're near Germany, please hit me up. Um, we're gonna meet up and um, we, uh, we're gonna share uh, like one of those great uh, Giga beers together, and uh, maybe we we're gonna do that someday. <laughs> yeah, 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 sounds good. Okay, great, Brian. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, and for everybody else, there's only one last thing we both have to say, and that's good. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> Wasn't this episode awesome? Let's accelerate the pace of innovation by subscribing to Tesla FX. It is my absolute favorite channel on the whole interwebs.